Hello and welcome to this very special interview panel. It, it's, a, it's a video, whatever. We're, we're here to, you know, to have a good time uh, as part of the Tabletop Gaming Virtual Spring Showcase. Uh, I'm Matt Jarvis. I'm the editor-in-chief of Dicebreaker. We are a board game and tabletop RPG website and YouTube channel. You can find us over at dicebreaker.com and youtube.com slash dicebreaker or on Twitter at join dicebreaker. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Cole Worley designer of the hour of the month of the year of the last <laughs> few years in many ways um who will be familiar to uh, many of you watching i had imagined from root uh, from pax premier perhaps uh, maybe from john company and also for cole's latest and upcoming game oath chronicles of empire and exile uh, which we are here today to discuss. Hey, Cole, thanks for joining me. <laughs> I'm I'm very happy to join you, and thanks to the Tabletop Gaming uh, Spring Expo, it's nice to have a chance to sit down and to kind of take a break and take a look at Oath, which I hadn't really been thinking about because I've been in, like, root land working on the new <laughs> Kickstarter and everything, which will, I think, have wrapped up by the time this airs. But it's nice to sort of, uh, sort of take a breath and think about something else for a little bit. I can imagine. It seems like it's been an incredibly busy few years. Root didn't come out that long ago in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> and it feels like you've constantly had projects on the go since, uh, and and not small projects either. They've always been these very kind of ambitious, impressive things. Um, so I think let's kick off with, for those who might be watching, uh, you know, like I said, they might know you from Root, they might know you from some of your previous games, um, but they may not have come across Oath before. So if you wouldn't mind, do you mind just kind of summing up what Oath is and kind of what players do in Oath? So Oath is a game that's being published by Leader Games, which is the, the primary company that I work for. It has, in a lot of ways, it has a, it's similar to Root. It has the same creative team behind Root, same artist, um, same style of, of production, but it's a very different kind of game. For one thing, it's, it's larger. I have a, my copy sitting right here, and I wish I would have grabbed a copy of uh, Fort or, or, or uh, Root for scale, but it's big. It's a giant big box, and it is a very different kind of game from the other things that we've published. Um, it, it's built around a system whereby um, when you win a game, instead of the game being over, how you won the game forms the start state for the game that follows it. So uh, it's a political game at its core, and so you can imagine playing a game of Twilight Imperium or a game of Game of Thrones, maybe. Uh, but when that when that player gets to seven castles or whatever you need to win a Game of Thrones, imagine that the next game takes place in a world where one player has sort of taken control of the whole map, and the other players are kind of existing in and around that kingdom. Uh, we're calling these chronicle games, but there, this isn't a, an established genre. It's kind of an experiment. Um, it, Oath kind of began with this very simple question when it came to the design, which is what if um, how a player wins is much more important than who wins? And the whole game kind of built out from that. Now, that's all very high-minded. High and so the other way that I like to explain Oath very simply is that Oath is a political roguelike. So if you've played roguelike games... Um, you're, you're going you're gonna to recognize a lot of the design techniques in Oath because the game is very um, sandboxy and open, and there are lots of different kind of like strange tools that you can interact with, but like every good roguelike, the joy of the game is in the unintended consequences. That's it. And it's worth clarifying because folks might have, they might be thinking of things like uh, Pandemic Legacy and mm -hmm. Legacy games like that where the outcome of one game kind of has an effect on future games uh, in the series. And Oath is, is kind of that, but also kind of not that, right? It's, it well, seems to have a knock-on effect, but it's not, you're not tearing up cards. It's not a permanent kind of state change. Yes, there is no, uh, there, there, so there's no permanent alteration of the game. Uh, at any time, I could take a box of Oath that might be 20 or 30 plays in, and I could revert it back to its first state. Or I could uh, do a random seed and revert it to kind of any state. Uh, Moreover, there there is no endpoint. So you know, when I think about uh, a traditional legacy game, legacy games are usually built on these big narrative kind of branching trees, and so every corner of the game has been written and curated in some way. Uh, Oath isn't like that. I have no idea the kinds of games that people are going to be playing with Oath and the kinds of stories they're going to tell. There's nothing scripted and there's no particular endpoint. So the engine is built so that you could play a single box of Oath a hundred times. Uh, now, that, that game will start getting very strange, uh, but 
because the players are controlling the strangeness, they can kind of create their own sorts of circumstances as they go through. And do you say you, you kind of approached both with that kind of core, I guess, question or, or idea in mind? So how did you, I guess, go from just having that idea of, I guess, like this kind of living memory of a board game to, to what's in the box now? You know, how did you build around that and go, okay, we've got this idea of things will continue on, but this is the... This is kind of the nuts and bolts gameplay. This is what we want turn to turn, as opposed to the the longer over five, ten, fifty, a hundred games. Well, we, you know, I, I usually when I'm working on a game project, I'll often have like a like a very simple idea that will or, or some kind of question. It's usually not like an idea for a game. It's just a sort of it's sort of a, a question or an investigation I'm doing about something relating to a game. And oftentimes the, the, these cook for a long time, like it might be a year or so that I'm just in the back of my mind, I'm working on other projects, but I'm just kind of thinking about this like essential, essential question. And Oath, Oath was like that. I actually started thinking about Oath in earnest um, right after we finished Root. So we finished Root in very early 2018. And after we were working on Root, I was thinking a lot about uh, king making and about the ends of games. And one thing that has always dissatisfied me is that I, I've played a lot of political games, and kingmaking is a really important element to those political games. I mean, in some ways, when you play a Game of Thrones or a game like that, the whole trick of the game is making sure that someone else helps you win, because you can't do it alone. Now, that, that's a very unsettling thought, because you want to believe that you won because of your own guile, and not because somebody at the last moment got bitter and pushed you into the chair. But if you think about all the great stories around kingmakers and fantasy and in history and everything like that, uh, that, that is the essential question. It's about how to put yourself in a position where you can benefit from uh, you know, the tide of history or something like that. And games are really bad at this, because I, you know, any moment that I've almost won a big long game and someone else has propped up someone, I recognize that that gives me like a bad feeling. Um, but it also is very true to the story and the theme of the game. And so I just started thinking about like how, like how do you, could, is it possible to design a game where that kind of king making was sort of an essential part of the game? And so I started thinking about this question of a game where the manner of victory was more important than who won. And, and th this is like, it's, it's so strange as you ask this question. I'm, I'm a long way away from thinking about like, oh, I want an infinite legacy game or like an infinite chronicle game. I'm, I, I've, I haven't, that hasn't even entered my mind, right? I mean, at, at this stage, I'm just trying to think about like, is there a way to make a game that is somehow sensitive to its own endings. And so out of that, I just started thinking about consequences, right? Like if you win a game by doing something horrible and dismantling a state or something and throwing the, the world into anarchy, th there needs to be a consequence, right? And so if the game state itself could adapt to th that decision, then players would start changing how they thought about the end of the game. Uh, and so, you know, it, victory is still kind of the, the important thing that brings all of us t t together, but it, I wanted some way to kind of like weave through the, this sort of tricky problem. So um, I, 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 I was stewing on all these ideas, and I was writing a, a, a piece for an academic conference on games about kingmaking, and I realized that what, what happens is that there... Um, when you, victory conditions are incredibly important because they orient all the players around the goal of the game. They get us all at the same table. It, and everyone's had a bad experience where maybe somebody who didn't really want to play the game starts doing their own thing, and it like breaks the magic circle. It's like a violation of the contract that put us all at the table. Uh, and I started thinking about how those violations, we usually frame them as negatively, right? They like broke the immersion. But there are other violations where someone at the table stops playing by the same victory condition, but it actually like takes the game to a higher level because they are so in character and spirit, and you see this in role-playing games a lot. And so the whole, so uh, when I had that realization, I started thinking like, okay, the key thing that needs to happen here is we have to make it so that the choices in that end game inform this larger story, and we kind of need the meta game. And, and all that happened, I know this is a long answer, but all that happened at the same time as I was listening to players who were playing a lot of Root talking about Root. 
And what they would do is e Root doesn't advance. Um, every, every game is kind of like takes place at the same present. Uh, but when players talk about their Root, they would say like, oh, back before this faction came out, we were playing it like this. And then the meta kind of changed. And I started looking at like how players talked about the Netrunner meta and other, other games, or even how I, I mean, I play a lot of online competitive games. And so all those conversations about the meta, if you just shifted your focus a little bit, they were kind of conversations about history. And so I started th wondering, like, is there a game, could, we, could you engineer a game that would engage directly with the meta? And if you could do that, maybe it was a way of addressing some of these kingmaking problems. Now, this is incredibly circuitous. And so, but, but, but I, I'm trying to give you a window into how I'm kind of piecing this together because I, you know, I, I had this idea for, for a game like Oath, but it took a year of wondering, like, is this even a game? Is this some weird think piece that I want to publish on my blog? Or, you know, or is it, you know, maybe I want to make a short film. Like, who, this doesn't have to be a board <laughs> game. Um, and the more I worked on it, the more I thought that actually the board games were incredibly well appointed to doing this kind of work. Because they're kind of like one, they've got one foot in tabletop RPGs and one foot in more advanced game systems, the kind of stuff we see in video games. And because of that middle space, they're both rigid and adaptable. And that's exactly what you need for this kind of, this kind of question. It was a long answer, but it was a, it was a bloody good one. <laughs> it's funny you say about Root. We, uh, so my group and I have had a weekly Root game going on the digital version. And like you say, it's... We are playing the the kind of core factions. So mm -hmm. there's the IRE, there's the Alliance, the Vagabond, and the Marquis de Cat. But we've seen that uh, kind of like meta game come in in that the Alliance won too many games in a row. So they became almost the kind of, they went from being the underdog to kind of being the boulder that everyone was trying to stop together at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But obviously we were starting fresh each time. So anyone that ended up with the Alliance, if we were choosing randomly, there was kind of sense of foreboding of, oh no, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's going to be out to get me. So a game that, that builds that into its own kind of life cycle and the way it's played multiple times is, is fascinating. But speaking of Root, obviously Root is, is well known for being asymmetric. Um, mm -hmm. You know, every faction plays differently. And in terms of Oath, there are kind of elements of that in the Chancellor and the Exiles and the Citizens who have slightly different powers, not to the degree of Root, mm -hmm. but, you know, they are... They're different kind of um, positions in the world and kind of around the table as well. Is that something you went in deliberately kind of, you know, intrigued to explore more of the, the idea of having players have different powers? Or was that something that just, again, developed as you were, mm -hmm. I guess, exploring this space of how the, the game would evolve over, over multiple plays? So we... At Leader Games, there's this interest in asymmetry. A lot of the games that we've done as a studio have been incredibly asymmetric. Uh, but it's always at the service of something else. You know, we, we like... Uh, asymmetry gives us access to certain kinds of stories that you can't tell if you have just have symmetrical player positions. Uh, and w w I, I'm always, I always make sure to couch things that way because asymmetry is very expensive when it comes to the game's uh, complexity budget is what I sometimes think of it like. If I'm going to make an asymmetric game, I know there are lots of things that my game can't do because I'm going to be spending a lot of rules and a lot of overhead and a lot of headache doing that. When we started working on Oath, it was very clear that building a game that could meaningfully adapt and could be played 20 or 30 times and generate you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of good stories, uh, that is, puts a big demand on the game system. And so the kind of sharp... Um, starting asymmetry, the baked-in asymmetry you see in Root, was never going to be totally on the, the table for Oath. Um, but there is some core a asymmetry. So players basically start in uh, one of three positions. They can be the Chancellor, who is the player who won the previous game. And they start, uh, they start with a headache. Uh, they own all this territory, they have all these liabilities, and then they have to deal with these other players, who, many of whom will be playing exiles, which are just like deposed kings, people on the outside of power, who are trying to chip away at the chancellor's position. Now, the chancellor is playing for time. They win if they can hold on long enough, uh, deep enough into the game that uh, there'll be chances of, chances of them winning each turn. That the game just kind of continues going on. Uh, but if the chancellor gets overwhelmed, uh, they can make offers of citizenship. And this is a very strange offer, and it's not seen in many games. But the way it works 
is the chancellor can give something to a citizen, a powerful item, or make some deal. And that enfranchises, sorry, can give it to an exile. That enfranchises the exile. All of their lands convert to the chancellor's color, and now the chancellor is kind of playing a shared player position where they and the citizens are working together. Uh, of course, only one of them is going to be the next chancellor, and so now they're being engaged on a succession condition. So the chancellor can say, I, I'm going to trade security of my kingdom for the liability that you might be the next chancellor. So there's like, a, do I want an external fight or an internal fight? And those citizenships carry through over the game. So uh, a kingdom with, with three citizens that stays in, in power will still have three citizens in the next game. So at the start of a game, you can find yourself like outside the kingdom, in charge of the kingdom, or inside the kingdom, but plotting for the overthrow of the chancellor. Now, those, uh, those positions don't have any difference of power. Uh, but you have the same actions. Everyone has basically the same actions. Um, the, but they can feel very different because all of the powers, all of the special powers in Oath are derived from cards. And the Oath has about 250 different unique cards. And they are really unique. So this is not like, they aren't unique in the way that a deck of card, cards has 52 unique cards. These cards are wildly unique. Um, for comparison, I think Root has uh, 15 unique cards in its deck. Um, and he, even if you play the Exiles and Partisans deck, I think it's a little bit more. I can't remember the number precisely. Um, but it, it's not many because there are copies and there are crafted cards in Root and things like that. Um, the cards in this game will push players into positions of emergent asymmetry that are almost as divergent as the asymmetry in Root. So for instance, one card a player might find, uh, one of my favorite cards is the Vow of Peace, which if you play this card, it's a Vow card, so you can never unplay it. You are stuck with it. And it means that you cannot fight. For the rest of that game, you can't attack people. But it's very hard for people to attack you. And if you have that card, uh, your game is going to be completely different from any other game, right? In the same way that, you know, if you have, uh, there, there, there's an item you can get called the Banner of Devotion, which makes you very good at recruiting warbands and building up your army, but your warbands never leave you. You can't drop them off to protect your territory. So it kind of turns you into this, like, roving army. Um, and so, I mean, and, and again, that's two out of 250. There are lots of these different powers, and if you start stitching them together, where you're like, okay, you know, I have, it's not the Banner of Devotion, it's the Ring of Devotion. But, you know, you can say, I have the Ring of Devotion, I have the, this roving army, and then late in the game, I, I capture this, like, valuable treasure that I need. And so I'm going to choose to take the Vow of Peace, which means I'm like a former warlord who's just now more of an, in a nomadic position. And what we tried to do with every single card is give the card really clear narrative beats that could interact with any of the other narrative beats. So um, because I don't, have the I don't have access to proper nouns or any kind of written narrative, there's no flavor text in this game except the names of cards. So when you're doing storytelling in that way, you can't say like, oh, this is the like ring of Xanth or something because nobody knows what that means. And I don't want to refer people to a novel or to a bit of flavor text that's going to explain what that is. So we just have to call it the ring of devotion because we need the word, like the name has to be very, very powerful. And then when we zoom out and we look at the entire card list, um, we, I try to think in terms of like a narrative system. So I want objects that are specific enough that they have heft, but also general enough that they can plug into any other narrative element so that you could almost do like storytelling jams where you just deal random oath cards face up and try to stitch them together in a narrative. And they're all kind of built with that sort of modularity. You, you mentioned earlier that you kind of at some point considered whether this was kind of a game or whether it was more of a, an experience for storytelling. And it seems like a lot of you know, the, the way the cards are designed feed into that, like, say, this idea of narrative. Um, mm -hmm. um, were you, did you feel at any point like you had to, I guess, shape it into more of a, a game shape? Like, you had to, you know, there are victory conditions, there yeah, are, yeah. you know, resources. Did those come about as a case of, like, well, we can't go too... You know, we can't reshape what a game is because players might find it impossible to understand. You know, they need to have some kind of objective. They need to have some kind of aim. 
or, or was that just something that I guess came back naturally in terms of you know that that's how history works at some point there are winners and losers and time flows on and, and it goes from there yeah well it, it, it's strange there is clarity in a game system that here uh, history never presents anyone right uh, if there is a game that's being played none of us know all the rules um, there that is that's a very good question so one of the weirdest things about working on oath is when you develop a game so sometimes people will ask me how much did a game get played before it was published and this is always a tricky tricky question because one answer you can give is that usually I find that by the time a game is done I've played it about 200 times usually between 200 and 300 uh, depending on the game um, but that that's a lie kind of because the game is changing in every single one of those plays so did I play the final version of Root? Like how many times was Final Root played before we published it? And the answer to that question is like three, four times. And so well, playing, when you're working on a project like Oath, um, immediately this is an immense problem because the whole game is hinged on, you know, I want these chronicles to la that players do to last for 10, 20, 30, 40 games. And I've played hundreds of games of Oath, but I've never played in a Chronicle that was that far advanced. And so there's a, a weird thing happening that uh, you have an idea for how a game is going to look, the shape of the game, what you want it to do. The way, you know, I, I sometimes tell people that Oath began with me thinking about how I wanted people to talk about the game when they weren't playing it. Like it was like that meta where I'm like, I'm not, don't, don't worry about the game. The game's a black box. What are the kinds of conversations I want to people to have about the black box? Now let's build a game that can sort of create that kind of conversational space. Um, so that's the goal. But I know, I know the realities of development are that I'm going to be playing this game a lot and it's going to be changing a lot, but I'm going to be starting over Chronicles constantly. Uh, and so this, this actually uh, put a very good pressure on development because it meant that Games had to be interesting as games. Every match of Oath had to be a compelling challenge. And I think this is actually one of the biggest problems that, falls, that some um, legacy games fall into, is that they kind of save the good stuff for later. And they start and they're like, a little simple and like a little boring. And it's like, it's like a TV show where someone tells you the first season's bad. And you just have to like make it through. I hate that. Like, are you kidding me? The first season's bad? We could have watched six movies. Uh, instead, we're just ramping up for something that's going to be less bad because we've got all this this fill. So it was really important that, like, in Oath, uh, the game starts with a little starting deck. Every one of the cards in the starting deck is, like, sharp and interesting and powerful, even though they're just the starting cards. We didn't want to make, like, an intro deck. Now, some of the later cards are a little bit more complicated, but they aren't any more, you know, I think, you know, players will still find themselves drafting cards from the starting set even very, very deep into a Chronicle if, they're, you know, if those cards are still hanging around their deck. Uh, so w when we were testing Oath, a lot of the tests that we did were from random seeds. So we had in our TTS, our testing TTS mod, we had a button that would just like create a completely random deck. And we did that because we just needed to test all the combinations. Now we can't test all of them. We can't even test like a meaningful section, but we can do our best. And it, it, really folk, it really made it so that we had to make sure that every match of Oath presented the kinds of players who like crunchy games with really interesting puzzles and challenges. Now, I, I'll add to this that uh, Oath, one of the things that Oath has both going for it and as a detriment is there are elements of risk in the game. Um, it, you know, you're going you're gonna to take a risk and you might lose and you, you, it might pay big. But those kind of gambits are like really essential to the whole uh, creation of the engine. So even though um, when, when we're designing this game, we're wanting the game to be strategically and tactically rich. Um, we also uh, know what sort of game it is, right? Like this is not, I just want, want to dis, uh, disabuse anybody who might be thinking like, oh, this game sounds really cool. I'm ready to like go on from Agricola. And it's like, you may not like this game because it is definitely not like an engine builder. Um, but it's still a pretty good game uh, in almost every circumstance. Like you will find yourself like make hatching plans 
and, and trying to execute them. And so those, you know, those gameplay elements were always very, very critical. Like, I, I never wanted the story of the game to, uh, to have to carry any weight. Like, I wanted the game to carry its own weight, I guess is the right way to put it. Hmm. At any point, did you, did you say kind of that, you know, legacy games are, are a different beast? But at any point, did you consider that maybe this would work as a legacy game? Like, were you constrained at all by the fact it needed to be replayable, you know, hypothetically forever, rather mm-hmm. than like, okay, we can get really wild and tear things up and have, you know, really permanent change? Oh, I thought it, well, so I, I'm really good, this is my, my one secret talent maybe of not doing things like that, where I'll create a little wall to work in, and the entire project, I was working on Oath, and I said that there, nothing will be destroyed, absolutely this, this game sticks around forever, I don't want any pre-scripted narrative, and it didn't even enter the conversation. However, the moment I was done with Oath, the next project that I've started working on, which we haven't announced yet properly, um, it adapts some lessons for Oath from Oath, but it operates in a three-act structure, so that every time you play it, you you play in a three-game like mini legacy game, and then it's okay. over. Uh, and it is so nice to be working on things that end, because it means I can be a lot crazier, and and really push the design space. Because I know I don't have to worry about the game healing itself. You know, if players really break Oath. Oath has safeguards that get engaged. So, for instance, uh, as the Chancellor, you, can, you get these relics. Players always get relics in the game, or, or they can, which are very powerful items. And when you become Chancellor, all of your relics that you had in the previous game get locked up in your reliquary, which means you don't get to use them for the next game, and you, you, those are the gifts you give citizens to enfranchise them. Now, uh, I like this because it's thematic and it's cute, but it also performs like a very, very critical role in the game, which is that if you find an absolutely critical combination of relics that's unbeatable, you won't get them two games in a row. And so Oath has a lot of safeguards like that to make sure that the game doesn't destroy itself. And, but uh, now that Oath is done and I'm working on other things, uh, it, it's, it's probably not surprising that my, my first thing was, oh, I definitely want to do games that end now. I'm back to that. <laughs> In fairness, I feel like a game that destroys itself could also be quite interesting. Yeah. Almost like a legacy game that you don't even need to touch and it just, it's just it eats itself. operates itself and eventually you've just got a load of torn up cardboard. <laughs> and... my, my copy um, of Brass was, was, was like that. I think after we had played it maybe 30 <laughs> or 40 times, you could hardly read the cards. Uh, you mentioned a couple of answers ago about Risk, and this is, this is a bit of a deep dive, but mm-hmm. it's something uh, I've been intrigued by. So your games are... They're built around arguments, and they're built around these very interesting kind of situations between players. But in, I think, nearly almost all of your games, there's very kind of careful use of luck. Um, mm-hmm. So dice rolls. Yeah. So in Root, it's combat. In Oath, I think it's all, uh, it's the end of the round to see uh, yeah, yeah. which round the game ends on. In John, John Company, there's the balance of India and things like that. But it always seems to be um, quite carefully considered where luck comes in. Is that something that yeah, just interests you as the kind of, you know, are you always tempted to just have that, that little bit of chaos in there rather than a completely hermetically sealed kind of perfect game? So I, I, I had, I had, there was a designer I knew once who talked about how uh, he always put dice in combat because dice were fun. And I hated this. He would say this all the time, and I just hated every time he said it because it seems so stupid. Um, because, uh, well, first of all, he's right. I mean, di- like, just from an emot- emotive a- you know, aspect, people will tell you that they like rolling dice and things like that. But I think it's a bad way to design. Um, so generally, I only want to put in, I only put in luck when it's, um, so all of my games, I should say something about general process. All of my games are built um, very system first. So I know, like, what the tension or the big question is and what I need the system to do. And then every mechanism is tuned to that system. So uh, this can drive playtesters batty uh, if they haven't worked with me before because it means that on the mechanical level, the games are changing constantly. You know, like, oh, I I thought I signed up for a worker placement game and now it's a card drafting game. And I'm like, it's about the system. It's not about the mechanism. Every mechanism needs to be tuned to the system. Um, So, you know, like, 
Oath, Oath is an interesting example because it changed a lot during the course of its development. But I always knew how many cards were going to be in the game and how many they, what, what the card flow was going to be like. And so, for instance, in Oath, uh, there is a small deck of cards that you uh, draw from. But the mechanism of drawing is that you look at three cards, you, get, you pick one to keep, and then two of them get discarded. But in Oath, almost all the economies are zero-sum. And so you don't discard them out of the game, you just discard them to a different region. And the draw pool of the game is mostly the cards that people are throwing away. And so it creates this, this very, it's like weirdly strategic. Um, because you, you'll draw a card and you'll be like, okay, I'm now aware that these other two cards are kind of like in the mix. And if I really wanted them, I could go chase them down, but I'm going to have to spend my entire turn chasing that second card. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the kind of gambit I want to make? Things like that. Um, so, so there is some chaos, though, in the drawing of a card. Um, but, it, it was imp but it was important to, in, in the context of the game, make it so that... Um, the deck was designed to offer players opportunities, but that they couldn't build their strategy around drawing the card they wanted. There are just too many cards in the game. And so uh, what, what I usually tell new players when they're playing is, like, don't worry about drawing unless you have no idea what to do. Because if you draw, you're going to get an opportunity, and if you already know what you're doing, then you don't, you don't need another opportunity on the, on the table because that opportunity comes at a high opportunity cost. So... Oath also has dice in it. All the games have dice. The most, I think the most infamous thing, <laughs> uh, dice roll in Oath. This is the thing, and now the game's getting ready to come out, and I'm starting to think about uh, what, what reviewers might say. Uh, I'm, I'm tickled by what they're going to make of uh, Oath's in-game, which is very old-fashioned. So starting at the end of the fifth turn, if the Chancellor has their victory condition fulfilled, they roll a die, and the game ends on a roll of a six. And if they fail the roll and they have their victory condition fulfilled on the next turn, the game will end on a five or six, and then a three or higher, and then it always ends. So basically the odds kind of double. They go from one out of six to one third, and then, you know, to, uh, to two thirds. Now, that's going to drive some folks crazy, but it, it has a very specific uh, reason for existing, which is that it encourages players to take risks and to seize the moment. Because if you know that someone is going to end on this turn, you know that you don't need to act in a very aggressive way. But if you're not sure when the end of the game is going to be, you have to behave a lot more aggressively, and you can make gambits. I could say, look, I'm going to snatch this victory condition and try to hold it, because I know there's a 1 in 6 chance that I win. And if I failed, so, and if I did win... It was through my guile, through my, my brave risk. And if I didn't win, I have now made the subsequent turn more interesting. And this, this was a lesson I learned playing Mark McLaughlin's The Napoleonic Wars, which is an old card-driven war game, uh, that ends on a peace roll, where at the end of each turn, you roll a die, and on a six, whoever has the most victory points wins. And p players can manipulate this die a little bit, but one of the things I love about it is uh, it means that if I'm playing the game, I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive because I'm uncertain about what the end is. It really captures the early romantic period very cleanly. Uh, and if I fail, so if I like try to snatch the throne, and, or maybe I succeed, but then I fail my role, the subsequent turn is now more interesting because my position is more exposed. And so it actually it, it blocks t uh, things like turtling. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm always, uh, I, I like dice, I think they're very useful, but um, they're, they're always uh, at the service of risk. So like another example that I would, I would quickly footnote is like the use of risk in John Company. Which is, uh, one of the comments that players sometimes give me about John Company is they want, um, so John Company is all about um, trying to re re retire family members and have them re retire in fabulous estates. Uh, and if you don't get the retirement role, you don't get victory points. Now, players will occasionally tell me, like, oh, I, I really wish I could score out my position, and I would just get X number of victory points for, you know, having all the titles that I have or something. And what, what they miss, what they don't understand, is that the uncertainty about who's going to re retire and win powers the game's negotiations. And that the, the more certainty the scoring system is, the more certainty there is in the scoring system, the more it dries up the negotiations. And so does it mean that occasionally a player is going to win because they got lucky? Of course. But 
you're you're getting something for that price and what you're getting is really fabulous negotiations you we've mentioned or you mentioned a couple of historical games there um and outside of leader um you're obviously kind of known for historical games that are based on you know real life periods of time and real life situations whereas your work at leader tends to be more abstracted you know root mm-hmm. is I see, i've seen comparisons of like the the vietnam war and things like that and Oath obviously has a grounding in real life history, but they are abstracted and they take place in fancy worlds of, you know, fighting right. cats and birds and so on. Um, when you come to design a game for Leader or or Open Root particularly, you know, when you're you're building these kind of real world arguments, but on top of a world that doesn't exist, so you can almost make it what you need it to be. Mm-hmm. You know, how does that shape? your your approach to those games you know do you feel like you have to you have to put those foundations in of well if this existed in real life here's what would happen i when i'm working on a history game my my primary goal not my primary goal but a main a primary goal one of many primary goals uh i guess it's a contradiction is to be true to the record and to the scholarship so when I'm thinking about, you know, right now in John Company, I've been stewing a lot about um, the law system in the new edition of John Company and trying to capture, like, what parliamentary politics felt like at the end of the 18th century. So I'm reading a lot of books, and I'm just sort of, like, just thinking about it. And I know that I, there are demands that, that are placed on that system because of the game, but there are also demands being placed on that system because of the historic record. And so it really limits you, uh, and it's a powerful limitation and a useful li- limitation, and it gives the uh, argument of the game more force. But when I'm working on a fantasy game, I don't have any of those limitations. The, instead, um, I try to think about the limitations as coming from two areas. So one of them is uh, narrative coherence, right? So when I'm working on a game uh, with Patrick or for Patrick, I'm thinking about, like, is this game, is the narrative making sense? And I think this is a place where a lot of thematic games, especially thematic games that have been designed in the last 15 years, they really fall flat. Because even though they're like uh, trading in a lot of the tropes of a genre or something, they, they sometimes lack narrative coherence, right? Like, why did that actually really happen? What, it, what explains that within the system itself? And so that is, that's a, a primary con- concern when I'm working on something like a root or an oath. Uh, The other demand, though, is uh, a demand that is a little strange, but it has to do with um, what you might think of as, like, the philosophy of the game or the angle. Um, Or or it's not, like, one thing I like about working on Root is that we're operating in a realm of political allegory. And so I can talk about things in Root uh, that might resonate with elements of, like, the Vietnam War or other things, um, but I, I don't have to worry about the particularities of Vietnam. Uh, what I do have to worry about is the coherence of the vision and the system, right? And so there, there's a narrative coherent, uh, coherence, uh, there's a narrative section to that coherence. There's also a philosophical coherence to that section. And so like when I'm working on Oath, I mean, I've, I, it was so funny when, we were, when I was very early working on Oath, I was, I was reading, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it, shucks. Um, it's th- th- this brilliant book by, uh, by an Arab historian from the, um, from like the 11th century or something. But it was entirely about uh, states and how uh, nomads come into positions of state authority and then are also removed from those positions and the flux of like the movement from the nomads to the cities and then getting displaced by a new nomad group going back out into the hinterland and then coming through and that that work was tremendously uh important in shaping how i was thinking about some of oath um and you know i i don't again i'm not i'm not going to worry about you know uh Middle Eastern politics in the ninth century or something and have to think that I need to make the game accountable to them. But it does help frame and inform the game. So, you know, when I'm working with these fantasy games, in one respect, they're very unhinged. There are a lot of different things that I can do. They also allow me to be trans-historical, which is really fun. I can, like, take some ideas from, like, the 20th century and put them in conversation with some ideas from the 8th century. And that's very exciting. 
Um, but they are, there are still demands being placed on them, and I've, I think about their demands as like they're either philosophical or narrative. You mentioned earlier the the kind of thought process you went through in terms of determining whether Oath, you know, could have even been a short film or, you know, how it would best make those arguments that you're putting together. In terms of, of board games particularly, do you ever, have there ever been any ideas where you've just thought that's too, that's too ambitious or it's too complex mm-hmm. to put into a bunch of tokens and a board and some cards? Oh, yes. Uh, so many. And, and, and in fact, um, you know, I'll usually kind of perform the, this little test when I'm working on a game, which is uh, what kind of thing should this be? So I'll have an idea and I'll be like, what kind of thing does this want to be? And then am I the right person to make it? Um, and and that, that second question is really tricky because sometimes there's a game I would really like to work on, but I'm just not the right person to make that to do that design and that might be because of my own subject position or might be because of my skill set or any number of things right like i am not equipped to make a movie so if i have a game that idea that actually is much more of a movie idea uh i'm gonna probably uh leave that behind because i'm not equipped to execute that the way it needs to be executed and there are lots of other good ideas out there and nobody needs my (laughs) my my bad movie idea um so uh one game though that i did abandon is I had this game, it was right before I got hired by Patrick. So right before I started working on Root, I was working on this game uh, where the players were going to play historians. And the idea was that this great empire, it was going to be kind of abstract in its theming, but this great empire had collapsed, and the players were trying to figure out why it had collapsed. And so the game would be encoded with like a collapse logic that then players had to decipher what had happened. And what would make it more complicated is that as you published books, you were also trying to steer the academic discourse towards whatever truth you were heavily invested in. So it was going to be about knowledge production and how, like, you know, uh, the academic pursuit both allows a deepening understanding but can also uh, lead to blind spots because there are interests in understanding things a certain way. Um, Now, I thought this was a dope idea for a game, and I, I, I spent a lot of time working on it. And I just couldn't get it to work. I couldn't get it to work because it needed specificity, but to design um, some kind of hidden logic, you had to, like, remove the specificity. Because otherwise, like, like you know, think about um, Clue. You know, like, the place, the person, and the weapon. But, you know, you don't know what the light, lighting was like. You don't know if they were surprised when they died. I mean, you don't have, like, a lot of the details that would make it a really vivid, like, murder game. And so, it, you know, it, it's just apples and oranges and grapefruit or something, right? When, when you're thinking about, you know, how, how the different, how the different uh, you know, axes of that, of that little deduction matrix play out. Uh, now... So I, I stopped working on it because it was clear that it was just not the kind of product for me. And then I was delighted when, I think last year, two games came out that kind of worked in the, in the same area. So you had um, The Search for Planet X, which kind of worked in the same area. I think it's a lovely deduction game, but it's also like very abstract and very simple, which was not what I wanted to do. And it kind of like validated my instinct of being like, okay, it, it would have been too simple to do the kind of... Uh, game that I would have wanted to do. And then the other game was a video game called Heaven's Vault, which is a fabulous game. And I'm so happy it exists because I've always wanted to play a game like that. And it, it was just one of those moments where, you know, obviously there was something good in the air that everybody was, 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 was stewing on, but I would have been absolutely the wrong person to try to make that game because the game form just wasn't well suited to those questions. I don't think I'm alone in saying that I would be fascinated to see Cole Worley's take on Clue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've, been, I've been stewing on a deduction game for... Not a deduction <laughs> game. I want a murder mystery game. And I've been stewing on one for a long time, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. Uh, you mentioned at the very start of our conversation, actually, about uh, the kind of consideration of, of Oaf's uh, system and the way it works as being like a... Maybe new genre is like overstating it, but, you know, you describe them as kind of Chronicles games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is this uh, a format or an idea that you are hoping or expecting to explore further in the future? Is it something that's that's kind of stuck with you now, and you're you're looking to apply it to to other settings or arguments? Yes, I I think it it it, it offers us a way out of some problems that have been vexing these kinds of political games for a long time. 
but I'm not sure that it's the right path. So, you know, it's funny when we built our schedule for the coming year, we actually put in this little break, which allows us to see how oath is received to see if, if in fact, this is the right way of approaching this problem. And uh, I, I hope that oath is received well um, because it will make it easier for me to justify working on the game I'm working on now, which riffs on the Chronicle system, but in a, in a closed fashion. And I think that, you know, if Oath is that, like, the very high complexity, high emergent gameplay, like, pull of, like, what we might think of as the Chronicle system, the other game that I'm working on is simpler than Root, much more jagged, not endless, but also working in kind of the same space. And so I'm hoping that, like, I can plant these two, like, poles, and that there might be a whole world of games that can kind of exist in that format. I think it's, I mean, if you're interested in doing... I think for a long time, uh, let me frame it this way. For, I feel like for a long time, um, there were several parallel conversations about what do games look like when we sit down to play a big strategy game? And what do games look like when we play an RPG together? And what do games look like when we play you know, a, 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 a computer game like Crusader Kings that like, doesn't really have an end condition but just kind of keeps going? And all of these conversations were happening in parallel with one another. And I think that they have really important things to teach each other. And Oath is kind of my effort to uh, get, get those three genres around the same table and see if there might be something that they can build together. Um, now, that might be a bad dinner party. And I'm, I, I, I fully, you know, this is whenever Patrick asks me, you know, if I'm excited about Oath coming out, I always tell him, like, I don't know what to expect. I'm very happy we got to make it. Um, and I think one, my, my general sense is uh, working in the game industry is a funny thing because uh, if anyone who's taken microeconomics knows that uh, one of those demand shifters is fashion and there's no explaining it. And so it always feels like a cheat whenever an economist to me talks about fashion because it just means it's something that they don't understand why it shifted. <laughs> but I recognize that I work in the entertainment industry and that the main shifter we all operate under is fashion. And that means that I'm not going to get to make games forever, that at some point people will start, stop playing them and do something else, which is fine. But it means for the meantime that if I have a chance to make a big game like Oath, I'm going to like make it as big and as Oathy as possible. Uh, and maybe this opens up a new space, and maybe it doesn't. And I, in either case, I'm just happy the thing got made. Fantastic. Uh, I think that, that feels like a nice place to leave it. Look at that. Cause... Oath, Oath is out soon. Is it's going out to Kickstarter back, backers? I think as of this going. Yeah, up. it is. I think it is on the water. By the time that this interview airs, it will either be on the water to you or arrived in certain ports. Uh, Europe is probably going to get it a little bit before the United States in a rare twist of events, but that's how it happens sometimes. Um, but hopefully, you know, folks will have it within the month or two of this, of this airing. Uh, and if you're interested in playing it, you can play it right now on Tabletop Simulator. We have the final version of the game up there. Uh, and we've, we have been, you know, at Leader, we are very transparent with all of our development processes as much as we possibly can be. And so if you're, if you're interested in our games, you can play them right now. And if you're looking for players, uh, you can just Google the Woodland Warriors Discord, which has kind of become the official Leader Games Discord. There are like probably two or three games of Root that happen every day on that Discord, and a game of Oath about every day too. So you can you can go find a game right now if you'd like. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Cole. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was, it was my pleasure, Matt. Uh, and I'll, I'll say that anybody who's interested in our work should absolutely follow us at Leader Games on Twitter. And I'm also at Cole Worley at Twitter. Um, my Twitter feed is just game stuff I'm working on. So if you just want to hear me ramble about design, uh, that's the place to go for it. Fantastic. Well, hopefully if they've watched this far, that's exactly what they're, <laughs> you know, they're in for. So <laughs> I can imagine there'll be a number of interested people. Um, again, I've been Matt Jarvis. I'm from Dicebreaker. You can find us at dicebreaker.com youtube.com slash dicebreaker and at join dicebreaker on twitter we play board games we play tabletop rpgs sometimes we squabble about them too but we're a nice bunch come and join us it's, uh, it's a good and... website <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs>